So I would like to welcome Dr. Autry. Today, um, he is an ASU professor and space policy expert. Dr. Yeah. Autry is a clinical professor of space leadership policy and business at the Thunderbird School of Global Management and an affiliate professor with the Interplanetary Initiative at Arizona State University. He also holds an appointment as a visiting professor in the Institute of Security, Science and Technology at Imperial College London. Welcome, Dr. Autry. If you'd like to share your slides, you can go ahead and do that. I will. Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody here. Um, this looks like it's a fairly intimate group, so I am open to taking questions. <clears throat> As we go along, I'll, I'll reserve some time at the end, but uh, if you've got a question or comment, just, uh, <clears throat> just intercede, okay? So first of all, I, I titled this how to get your butt to Mars, uh, borrowing from uh, my friend and everybody's Buzz Aldrin, uh, who likes to say we need to get our butts to Mars. <clears throat> um, I want to share with you the idea that there are different paths to doing this. A lot of people kind of assume that you're going to have to become an NASA astronaut, or you're going to have to follow a, a STEM career in order to, uh, to get to Mars. But, uh, you know, frankly, Mars is going to to need everyone. Um, and getting to Mars is a process that is as much about um, the policy decisions and the strategies business-wise and the funding as it is about technologies and science. Uh, you folks are probably mostly too young to have seen the movie, The Right Stuff, but I strongly recommend you do see it. And there's a famous line from there, um, no bucks, no buck Rogers. Um, and when I was nominated to be NASA CFO a couple of years ago, a, a friend gave me a, a, a desk plaque that said no bucks, no buck Rogers to, to put on the desk there as the chief financial officer. Uh, unfortunately, because of American political problems in 2020, I didn't end up occupying that desk, but I did give it to my good friend, Steve Shen, who was the acting uh, CFO and is the deputy CFO there at NASA, and, and he still has that. Uh, but it's an important message. Um, and it's one of the reasons I teach a course called Space Leadership Policy and Business. In fact, it's a full master's degree program. We'd all like to see you in someday. It's like an MBA for space, uh, but it acknowledges that leadership policy and business uh, have to work hand in hand with, uh, with technology. And I know from a lot of your other speakers uh, and, and including Bob Zuber, and you're going to get a, a technical uh, serving full. So I'm going to look at alternative career paths. So I am at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, anybody in the audience uh, know who that is, what that is? I hear a deafening silence. Thunderbird's kind of an odd name for a, a school, much less a business school, isn't it? So I often get this expectation, particularly when I'm with my good friends in London. Uh, there was a puppet show from the 1980s and 90s in, in, in Britain uh, that was about a group called the Thunderbirds who uh, <clears throat> flew spaceships and, uh, and high-performance uh, aircraft. Uh, anyway, no, it's, it's not that. Uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management was actually founded by Army Air Corps engineers in 1946 who came back from uh, World War II in the Pacific and in Europe and realized that the 20th century was going to be about globalization. And they felt that the U.S. needed to have a better understanding of what global business and global leadership meant. So they founded a school specifically for that. And I'm so excited to be at what I think is the next tipping point. Um, we went through global business in the last century. We're, we're going to be looking at interplanetary business in the next century. Uh, and Thunderbird has kindly stepped up again to host me uh, to help us put together the first management program for the people that are going to be doing business uh, outside the atmosphere. Uh, we've got a really cool building in Phoenix. If you're ever there, reach out to me and uh, I'll be glad to try to uh, see if I can't arrange a, a a visit, but it is the most advanced business school in the world, in my opinion, technologically. Uh, for instance, that cool globe you see in the atrium there, that's actually a digital uh, globe, and we can do things like put satellite tracking maps or debris field maps on that, or look at climate change uh, or uh, weather activities in, in, in real time on, uh, on that globe, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, there's one of our classrooms on the left and our building in Los Angeles uh, where I teach on the right. And we've located our business in Los Angeles. Can anybody think why? And I'm not going to continue until somebody in the audience tells me why we're located in Los Angeles instead of Phoenix. Come and volunteer, or I'm a professor and I'll cold call on somebody. Sharia says JPL. Okay, that is a good point. So yes, uh, there is a great space history in, uh, in the LA area, and JPL is part of that. Uh, for many people don't know, JPL is not actually a NASA center like Kennedy Space Center or Johnson Space Center uh, or Glenn or Ames Research Center. It is an FFRDC. Does anybody know what an FFRDC is? I bet you don't. So I'm going to tell you. It's a federally funded research and development corporation. That means it's a business technically, uh, but it was established and capitalized by the United States government to achieve a specific purpose that the United States government had. And you might guess from its title what that purpose was, jet propulsion. Uh, it was set up to help build jet engines and early rocket tree for the United States government, primarily the military in the early days. Uh, and its major customer is always the US government, but not its only customer. Uh, it's done business with uh, with other companies. Does anybody aware of anything that JPL has done besides for the U.S. government? No. And yes, SpaceX is a good reason, and I'll get to that too, but let's talk about JPL. Uh, a few years ago, JPL made special swimsuits for NASA that were high performance, or for Nike, not NASA, for Nike, that were super high performance and allowed Olympic swimmers to set new records and capture medals. Those suits were so good uh, that they were actually outlawed, but uh, they had special material characteristics that allowed the swimmers to go through the water quicker, and the, uh, the Olympics decided to make people stop using them. So SpaceX, yeah, SpaceX is just like 10 miles down the road from where we're located. And anybody else in that area can you think of? Go ahead and type it in if you would. We got JPL, we got SpaceX. Is there a NASA center in Southern California? Does anybody know? Another commercial space company besides SpaceX? Well, I guess not, but let me inform you. California has two NASA centers, the Ames Research Center. Oh, excellent, Vandenberg Space Force Base too, yeah. Uh, so we do SpaceX launches as well as launches from United Launch Alliance out of uh, Vandenberg and uh, <clears throat> other companies like um, Firefly um, are working to launch from there as well and Relativity has a pad there. So a lot of space launch happens from California as well as Florida. It's used to do uh, polar or sun synchronous <clears throat> launch orbits. But we've also got the Ames Research Center up in San Jose and Silicon Valley area, uh, which connects NASA in a lot of ways to the, the Silicon Valley uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, and a lot of cool things have <clears throat> come out of Ames. They've got the world's coolest wind tunnel up there, which does re-entry simulations. It allows you to generate plasma and high energy heat in that uh, that wind tunnel, as well as basically supersonic speeds and test uh, the re-entry for space capsules. So uh, PICA, a material NASA developed, uh, is an ablative uh, re-entry uh, protection system for capsules came out of there. And PICA X, the version that SpaceX uses, was uh, developed by a team there uh, led by my friend Dan Rasky at Ames. Uh, there's one more NASA center in, uh, in California besides uh, JPL and Ames. Does anybody know what that is? If you'd seen the movie, The Right Stuff, you would have seen it. So up in the high desert of California, there's a big Air Force base called Edwards Air Force Base. You should be familiar with it. It's really where uh, the American space program got started. High performance aircraft were tested there for years uh, at a facility um, that was associated with NASA's predecessor, NACA, the NACA, which was developed to give the United States an advantage in aircraft development. Uh, so the Bell X-1, the first vehicle to break the sound barrier, flew out of there at what is now the NASA Armstrong facility. Um, and that, that center is called Armstrong. 
uh, and uh, the space shuttle, the first several times it landed, landed uh, uh, on the desert there in, in California, not, not in Florida. Uh, to this day, uh, a lot of cool NASA aviation uh, testing uh, programs go on at, uh, at Edwards. Well, we've also got other companies besides SpaceX. Uh, I'm surprised nobody's thought of this, but there's a company called Rocket Lab. I assume you've heard of them. Uh, they're in Long Beach, California, uh, about 20 miles from, from where I teach. Blue Origin is not in Southern California. They're up in Washington, um, but they're looking to recruit in Southern California, and that's something I'm working with them on. Can anybody think of some smaller startups? or another space tourism company who competes with Blue Origin and suborbital flights. Uh, Virgin Galactic, absolutely. Virgin Galactic is located uh, just down the road from the Armstrong Center uh, up at Edwards. And that's no, no mistake because the design of that vehicle with a carrier aircraft that drops a, uh, a rocket powered rock, uh, space plane from the bottom was a design that uh, that NASA and the Air Force put together out at uh, at Armstrong in the 1960s. It was called the X-15, and uh, Neil Armstrong and others got their uh, their first taste of uh, spaceflight in the X-15 space plane, uh, which was carried up to a, a high altitude by a uh, a bomber and then dropped from the bottom and ignited its rocket engines to take out. Uh, there was a actually a design to uh, turn that into an orbital space vehicle as opposed to just a suborbital, uh, but it was uh, it was not funded. But uh, a number of American suborbital space flights were made with that vehicle from California, and uh, uh, astronaut wings were awarded for that. Virgin Orbit, Richard Branson's orbital launch company, which launches satellites by dropping the rocket from the wing of a 747, is based in Long Beach as well, not far from Rocket Lab. Uh, and in addition to Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit, you've got Relativity Space. Relativity Space, can anybody tell me what they do? What is their secret sauce? Anybody heard of Relativity Space? I'm surprised if you hadn't. So Relativity is a startup. Uh, by two students at USC, uh, Tim Ellis and Jordan Noon. Uh, I was proud to meet them back in 2014 when they were in the undergrad rocket propulsion lab there. And uh, I've helped uh, occasionally from time to time uh, in, advise and mentor them, but they've raised $1.3 billion uh, at a $4.2 billion valuation. They have a launch pad, a dedicated pad out at uh, the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida and one at Vandenberg. Uh, and they are building rockets entirely with 3D printing. So they've got uh, 3D printers um, that are bigger than the room I'm in, uh, you know, uh, like 20 by 20 feet uh, that are like 100 feet high. And, and they've got multiples of them. And they print the whole rocket, not just engine components like SpaceX and some other companies are using additive manufacturing to print complex uh, internal components uh, like turbo pumps and stuff. They, they print the whole rocket, the tank, the, the fuselage, they print the fairing. Um, can anybody think of why you would want to 3D print a rocket as opposed to assemble it? Geometry that wouldn't be possible with traditional methods of engineering. Uh, yeah, exactly. So you can make shapes that you couldn't do. Uh, cost? Why would the cost be lower? That's a great, great, uh, great story. Cost is lower because of automation and consequently less sweat. We're thinking like business. Yeah. Less labor. Dead on, right? So less labor. Um, and somebody mentioned less parts and not only less parts, but what if you want to make a change, right? SpaceX has an amazing automated factory and they've really revolutionized the, uh, the business of rocketry. And it's not just about uh, them uh, reusing rockets. In fact, they've never passed that cost of reuse onto the market. When SpaceX entered the market, launches from United Launch Alliance were running about $400 million per flight. SpaceX drove that price down rapidly within just a few years to under $100 million and it kind of parked at like 65 to $75 million. They did that by revolutionizing the manufacturing of robots, by making it uh, rockets, by making it 
automated and assembly line like like an auto factory instead of bespoke united launch alliance and arian spas and russ cosmos and the, the chinese companies all built each rocket uh individually for a specific mission right spacex's uh policy was we're just going to build as many rockets as we can they hired a guy named andy lambert from bmw mini uh to set up their uh their assembly line and then we'll go sell them and, and we don't we're going to disconnect those processes just like every other business does we're not going to build rockets one at a time so uh they did that um and and they drove the cost way down but they've never lowered the price since they started reusing the rockets they're capturing the profits from reusing the rockets internally because they've got frankly enough business uh, with all their launches so somebody mentioned less waste yeah so when you machine aluminum or other metals or you use carbon fiber uh, a lot of the scrap material uh, uh, goes away, and at best it gets recycled, but some of it actually goes to the landfill, right? Uh, so this is a really important point. Uh, carbon fiber is a good example. I've actually helped fund another student from USC running a company called Elevated Materials. You should uh, look it up. I'll, I'll type it in here. Uh, at least I think I'll type it in here. I'm not typing for some reason. I don't know why I can't type, but okay. Uh, elevated materials captures the carbon fiber scrap from space companies and uh, and turns it into skateboards and drone frames. There you go. Thank you. Google that. Uh, anyway, I can't say what companies we get the scrap material from, but you can probably guess. Anyway, that was a USC student I helped fund. So there's a lot of opportunities in the space business to look at it as, as a business as opposed to just a goal. Now let's talk about Mars though. Uh, what would Relativity Space, who's located in Long Beach, uh, have to do with Mars? Why would there be a special advantage to their model of 3D printing rockets uh, versus other companies from Mars? down yeah well you can transport the 3d printers to mars they're probably easier to transport than transporting a full mars ascent vehicle like in the martian right where you've got to pre-deploy a whole friggin giant uh, multi-stage rocket in order to get your people off the surface um yeah and you can use material on mars so you just need to send a, a fairly compact uh printer uh that can be uh, put together on Mars and, and then hopefully you can start to mine and utilize a lot of the material on Mars uh, to print the rockets, right? In addition to then uh, capturing uh, uh, methane or using CO2 uh, uh, and hydrogen to, uh, from water to make methane. Uh, so not only will we, we get our propellant, but we could actually build our, our rocket on the surface. A lot easier than building a traditional factory with stir welders and cutting machines and having a foundry to, <laughs> to make aluminum. So uh, it's an exciting story. And that's really what uh, Tim and Jordan's mission was to, uh, to 3D print rockets on Mars. Uh, so anyway, that's why uh, I've got my company in LA. And uh, if you're in the LA area as well, uh, you should uh, check out some of those companies. So what do you think the most important factor in career success is? And I know this is a, a big question. Anybody want to tell me some important factors in career success? Creativity. Louder, I'm sorry. Creativity. Creativity. I love that one. Yes. If you can't think of new things to do, uh, you're going to have a harder time competing uh, with a uh, with other folks. And if you are able to create new new ideas uh, that haven't been done before, you can move from what's called a red ocean business environment where everybody's brutally fighting each other for profit margin to a blue ocean environment where you don't have any competitors. And a good example of that is, is SpaceX uh, moving into the reusable rocket they, uh, industry. They, they kind of choose a, chose a new ocean to, uh, uh, to be in. And right now uh, they don't have any competitor there. Make yourself unique, right? Again, you don't want to just be a, a another competitor in a in a tough market. Consistency, that's really important. Uh, why do you think consistency is so important? Sian, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, but what makes consistency important for a career? 
Yeah. Uh, and when I say quality products, I mean, you as an individual need to be somebody who can be depended on to deliver. And, and whether that's you're physically making something or you're an engineer and you're designing something or you're a business person and you're putting together a management team and recruiting, whatever it is you do, you need to have a reputation for being able to do it consistently. Now, I want to be careful to, though, to say something really important that NASA doesn't always get, and that is failure is an option. It is okay to fail occasionally because if you're not falling down, uh, as they say in skiing or snowboarding, you're not learning. Um, you've got to be able to, uh, to take a little bit of risk, but people also have to be able to depend on you. So it can't be uh, really unlikely that you're going to succeed. It has to be 90% of the time you're going to succeed and you're going to succeed well and they know what to expect. But don't eliminate all failure from your model because if, if you're not taking enough risk, you're not going to be that, that unique person or, and you're not showing that creativity. Patience, there you go. Uh, it's not always going to be easy. Uh, the world is not fair. Uh, let me be really care, <laughs> careful to tell you that. Anybody that told you like there's justice and fairness and equity in the world, those are noble things to aspire to, but it is an uphill battle for every single one of us, uh, regardless of where you come from and what your station in life is. Uh, things are going to go wrong that are out of your control. Uh, and being angry, frustrated, or blaming it on somebody else is no good. You, you've got to have patience. Uh, skills. So there we go. How do you get those skills, Tobias? You need skills to become a real professional, whether that's an engineer, a scientist, a business person. And communications is one of those great skills. Where do you get skills? You order them on Amazon Prime Day? All right, very cool. So uh, are you telling us, Tobias, that your years of experience gave you skills? It was on the job learning, basically, at uh, UM? There you go. Exactly. So where's a more traditional place to get skills? And hard work, yeah, Elon would be the first to tell you work hard. Yeah, so university is a place people expect to acquire skills. Uh, I am a big fan of on-the-job learning. And I can tell you when, you know, Elon first started SpaceX, uh, he actually consciously avoided people <laughs> who had college degrees, in particular people who had advanced college degrees. Uh, that's interesting that you dropped it. That's an experience that uh, you and I, Tobias, have in common, along with a lot of other interesting, successful people. Let me mention Steve Jobs, who dropped out of school, Bill Gates, who dropped out of school, um, Richard Branson, uh, who I don't even think finished high school, right? So Although you can learn a lot of things at school, and obviously I, I believe in it, it is by far the only path. And often it is a path that leads you away from creative thinking and into uh, to being just like everybody else, because it's a, a system designed to produce a lot of outcomes, a quantity, rather than necessarily a few specific high quality outcomes. You have to take school and make it your own is my story. So let me continue my slides. And I wanna get rid of these what is the most important factor? But, you know, what is career success? I'd love to know, what do, you, what do you guys think is success for you? Because it's not the same for everybody. I mean, it's not just about having a higher salary, uh, which a lot of people would give you as a good qualitative measurement of success. And, and it can be, but what good is money unless you have some, some bigger vision? Uh, some of you, if you would, type in and tell me what you think a successful career would be when you, when you get to the end of your days. Okay, leading a team. There you go. Could you be more specific? Yeah, uh, advancing your field, uh, accomplishing your goals. Give me something specific. Uh, I'll tell you what I wanted to do. I'm, I'm going to type in there you go, line of aircraft. I'm gonna type in some things I wanted to do when I was 18, like my bucket list. Go to space. That was the top, go to space, right? Um, own my own business. Make a million dollars.
Okay, so I wanted to do all these things. I have done all these things except go to space. Uh, and I think that's within my reach, right? Um, there you go, save the climate. And uh, I would love to hear more about that. I don't have time within uh, this speech device, but I hope you have a solution. Uh, Bob Zubrin and I share a real interest in uh, promoting nuclear power, which in my opinion is the uh, only uh, short-term uh, real way to, uh, to solve that climate problem, but I'm happy to hear about anything else. <clears throat> okay, but the point I wanted to make is, is you need to define career success. And I'm going to tell you something else. It's a moving target, right? Um, I don't know what, where you all are in your, your career path, but you were described as students to me, so I assume that you're, that you're learning and thinking about where you want to be. Uh, it'll change as you start checking things off your bucket list. New items will arrive. So what do you want to achieve? Um, so I want to point out to you, entrepreneurship could be an incredibly fun and profitable route to whatever your real dreams are. So we've got pictures of folks there. Um, and I actually took all these pictures, uh, except for the one of Elon and I, which somebody else took with me there. But uh, in the top left-hand uh, photo, uh, there's a gentleman named Paul on the left. Who can tell me who that is? This guy was a big science fiction nerd. Uh, his number one goal was, was always to go to space. He also was really interested in contacting uh, and communicating potentially with, uh, with other, uh, other civilizations in our galaxy. Anybody know who Paul is? It's the guy with the baseball cap there on the left next to uh, astronaut Mike Melville, who's just gotten out of Spaceship One and is giving the thumbs up because he just made the first commercial human space flight in 2004. And the guy bowing to him on the right is one of the world's greatest engineers, Bert Rutan, who, who designed that, that vehicle, which became the, the model for Virgin Spaceship Two. Nobody knows who Paul is? All right, I will tell you, that is Paul Allen. Anybody know who Paul Allen is? Absolutely not. Paul Allen was Bill Gates's business partner and co-founder of Microsoft. There you go. All right. But Paul really wanted to go to space. But like a lot of people at that point in time, including myself, when we entered the job market, space was not really an option. There were not very many NASA astronauts. And after the Apollo era uh, cutbacks and the space shuttle turned out not to fly as often as it was supposed to. It was supposed to fly every couple of weeks, maybe every week carry payloads for several hundred dollars a pound to space, ended up flying every few months and carried payloads at tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars per pound. Uh, we could, we, there was no career in space for us, so we went into software, right? And other people who did that include Elon Musk, um, Jeff Bezos, uh, they all wanted to, uh, to really go into space. But by being entrepreneurs, they were able to define their own long-term career path because having a little bit of money uh, and a lot of great connections is a good thing. So Paul Allen funded uh, Spaceship One, the first commercial uh, vehicle to carry a human being to space, and it did that three times in 2004. Uh, he also funded the SETI project. The U.S. government stopped funding the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There's a big telescope array, uh, radio telescopes called the Allen Array, and uh, Allen funded that. Uh, he also started a company called Strato Launch to build a world's largest aircraft to carry a large orbital rocket. Uh, unfortunately, Paul died of, of cancer. If he hadn't have, I would have bet you he would have been himself half flown in space by now, probably on, on Richard Branson's flight last summer. Um, Bezos, right? Uh, wanted to go to space, started a used book company instead. Uh, but by being an entrepreneur, he leveraged that into being able to do what he wanted to do. Branson always loved space started a music company and an aircraft uh, air, airline and got where he wanted to. Oh, I see. I am typing only to Nicole. Thank you, everyone. I apologize. I was only typing into Nicole's box because I had a response. All right. Anyway, look at Paul Allen. Interesting guy. Uh, Elon, of course, started out in software. Uh, first as a video game developer, like I did. I started a video game company in high school as well. Uh, and then he went off to uh, 
to start a uh, company that used early internet data to provide locational services. Uh, and he sold that to Compaq for $300 million zip to go. Then he found uh, X.com, which merged with PayPal and became uh, a online banking system that he sold for over $3 billion to eBay. And then eventually got to do what he wanted to do, which was of course uh, SpaceX. So my path has been non-traditional. Uh, you are looking where I used to live. Um, this is a place called Irvine Meadows. It was a trailer park on the campus of the University of California, Irvine, for people that could not afford to be in the dorms. And I came from a single mom uh, family, uh, uh, and I was a first generation college student. Nobody in my family had ever even thought about going to college, to tell you the truth. Um, this is where you left. Uh, I lived in a 19 foot trailer with two other guys and a dog um, that's smaller than the room I, I sleep in now. <laughs> um, and uh, I didn't really last very long in school. So I dropped out of school, uh, just like Tobias, and my GPA was 0.875. Right? Why was that? It was the video game company that I'd started in high school actually did pretty well. And yeah, that's me on the left. I had hair. Uh, we made a game that looked a lot like uh, Pac-Man, right? And that was a popular thing to do at the time, make a home computer version uh, of an arcade game where you put quarters in. Um, Atari purchased the rights to, to Pac-Man and uh, decided to sue me at age 18. Uh, I didn't know uh, much about being sued. Uh, I was in a lucky position though. Uh, when they came to uh, uh, the computer show uh, to hand me a cease and desist order. There was a journalist named Jerry Pornell interviewing me. Does anybody know who Jerry Pornell is? Anybody heard of Jerry Pornell? Okay. Google Jerry, a very important person who changed your future and you don't know it. Uh, Jerry was a science fiction author of some repute during this period of time. And most importantly, he actually influenced US space policy quite a bit. Uh, he got a hold of Vice President Dan Quayle during the uh, George H.W. Bush administration in the early 90s, and he convinced the United States government to fund a project called DCX, or Delta Clipper. Does anybody know what that is? I want you all to go Google DCX Delta Clipper and look at the videos. You're going to be amazed. Back in the 1980s, Boeing made a reusable rocket that took off horizontally, transitioned or vertically transitioned horizontally, flipped, and came back down and landed vertically. People at SpaceX that worked on that technology and at Blue Origin got it from DCX. Some of them actually came from that project. That was eventually going to be a single stage to orbit rocket, uh, but unfortunately funding got cut. But Jerry Pernell was personally responsible for making that happen. I don't think we'd have SpaceX reusable rockets or the Starship design today if it wasn't for what Jerry did. Jerry just coincidentally also, yeah, uh, Northrop Grumman's vehicle is also interesting. Uh, anyway, Jerry also saved my personal butt. So when I got served with that uh, legal uh, uh, paper, Jerry was standing next to me interviewing me because he was also the top journalist for a magazine called Byte Magazine, which was the big computer magazine of the day. He wrote this article and, uh, and said, Atari leans on entrepreneurial teens. This scared the Atari uh, marketing folks so much that they didn't want to look like bad guys suing some poor long-haired entrepreneur like me, that they instead bought our product and it became the actual official home pack man for... Uh, uh, for personal computers at the time. Um, and I got paid for it instead of sued into Bolivian. Uh, so networking is super important. And frankly, sometimes you're just lucky. Life is not fair. I had a lot of disadvantages in my life, but what the heck, Jerry Purnell happened to be standing next to me at the exact right moment in time. Uh, I did software engineering. Uh, I worked on uh, systems that, uh, that did blood separation for uh, plasma donations. If you go to uh, donated a plasma center or platelets these days, you'll see this machine called the Auto Freeze to See. I wrote the, the first code for it. Uh, I worked on uh, torpedoes and guided bomb units and trainers for uh, repair of uh, 
a vehicle. So that was my engineering career, right? But it wasn't going to get me into space. Uh, and I decided I need to make more money to go there. So I started a company uh, doing break and fix computer hardware. There I am with my partner, John, and that was our facility. I learned to build that out. I built like everything in that building uh, and sold it and made some money. I started a digital uh, uh, image studio for early internet e-commerce companies in the 90s. Uh, back then, you bought that camera you see that guy with for $10,000. It was a one megapixel camera, $10,000. Anybody know what company invented the digital camera? Ironically, yes, Kodak, the company that was killed by the digital camera. Kodak invented the digital camera, but would not invest enough money in, in that business to own that market. Uh, they kept trying to protect their film and print uh, business, and the digital camera killed them. Uh, this is a story that has happened over and over. We see it happening in the space industry, where some companies try to protect their current model legally and in their any way they can, instead of trying to adapt and realize that the space market is moving on and they've got everything they need, right? I mean, they've got billions of dollars and thousands of great employees and an amazing history. And sometimes they don't invest in them, their own future. They're too busy protecting their past. This is called market disruption. It, it happens constantly. And I saw it happen back then. Okay. So because I finally made enough money, I had a few million dollars this time, I could go back to school on my own terms and do an executive MBA. There am I graduating uh, with my son there holding the globe. Uh, he has it properly upside down with Australia out front. So anybody, you from the Southern Hemisphere can be happy about that. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, making a little bit of money before you educate is an option and it's not a bad career path because you get a lot more choices there. So I did not have to uh, uh, starve my way through, uh, through school anymore like I did when I began. Uh, so I did a... Uh, Undergrad that took me 13 years and graduated in 1999. I did an MBA immediately after that. Uh, and then I founded several other companies, uh, a computer networking uh, company. Uh, and the objective of that company was to have a lot of fun. Uh, we had no offices. We were one of the first virtual companies back in the 90s. Uh, and we went out and did cool things that we wanted to do while, again, making a lot more money. So I could then take my formal education to the next level, did my PhD. Uh, and got a job at uh, the Marshall School of Business after that. Uh, my PhD was the first PhD thesis to look at the uh, commercial space industry as a, uh, as a research context. Uh, and uh, my PhD topic was governmental roles in the emergence of new communities of high technology organizations, but I used the commercial space industry uh, as my research context. And, so I've been studying commercial space now as a research scholar for uh, for 20 years and have more experience than anybody doing that. Can anybody think of why it's really cool to be a researcher, a PhD researcher or a college professor in the space industry as opposed to maybe being a business person in the space industry? What advantages I have? It's not pay. And you have this advantage while you're a student. That's why I'm talking to you. With uh, scientists? What about them? You can use it to get information that would help you build new uh, spacecraft. Yeah, and how do I get information? Yeah, I get to see the ideas my students come up. So, so I got to meet Jordan and Tim when they were students, right? Before they founded Relativity Space. I got to meet Ryan who founded the company that upcycles the carbon fiber. Uh, so yeah, I learned as much from my students and stay up to date on things as I teach them. Uh, but I learned things from scientists and from business leaders and from top policymakers because they like academics. Okay, more freedom to do the right stuff. I love that. But if I go out and I try to talk to somebody at NASA headquarters or, or the base force as a professor, I have credibility and I'm not threatening. If I'm a business person, I'm probably trying to sell them something and they have a process for dealing with that. And they, you start out at the bottom of the system and maybe you'll work your way to the top. But it is amazing when you're a student or professor, you reach out to people at the top level and they respond. So I reached out to, uh, to Bert Rutan at Scale Composites in 2003 and said, I'm writing a business case study on uh, um, 
on commercial space, can I come out? And I mean, they gave me front row seats and I got to hang out with Paul Allen and uh, uh, eventually meet uh, Richard Branson and everybody because people love education. So leverage that to your advantage. So uh, I taught at uh, UCI. I taught at uh, the Marshall School of Business, as I mentioned, and I'm now at uh, Thunderbird. Also do a lot of work for, for Oxford. I did a whole series of cool space videos for them. I'll try to bring that up in a bit and share it in the chat. Uh, you might enjoy those. Uh, and I'm a visiting professor at Imperial College London. Uh, always be networking. So by being a professor, I was able to make a lot of these connections. And uh, I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to spend quality time talking to, to Elon, to Jeff, to, uh, to Richard Branson. I got to know Paul Allen before he died. Uh, amazing. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't uh, didn't pursue that academic career. But the academic career was leveraged by my ability to uh, uh, to make some money entrepreneurially. That allowed me to get that picture in the upper right hand corner. Does anybody know what vehicle I'm in? Any guesses as to what vehicle I'm in in the upper right hand corner there? Giving you the thumbs up. Apex capsule that they launched a few uh, months ago? Yeah, no, it's not the, the Crew Dragon, although I have had the opportunity to sit in the Crew Dragon. And I'll tell you my favorite Crew Dragon story. Don't share this. Um, you know how when you get in your car, there's the slot between the chair and the council where things like your phone can fall down into and they're hard to get out? Uh, so I was visiting SpaceX and there were a couple astronauts there doing training in their crew, full Crew Dragon capsule that they have for training missions. And they invited me in. <laughs> so I get to go in and in any space capsule, like the one you see me in there, you lean back right in that chair. And the first thing that happened is, is my phone fell out of my pocket down into the Crew Dragon and you could hear it go clink, clink, bink, clink, clink. And it was way freaking down inside there, right? We all had to get out of the crew drag. They had to bring in the engineers with the tools and start opening the floor panels and compartments to go find my phone. Yeah, you can imagine the <laughs> the flack I got for that. But one of the one of the technicians looked at me and said, "Don't worry, this happens all the time." Uh, anyway, uh, the vehicle I'm in there is actually the Boeing. Um, um, Starliner CST-100 vehicle that uh, just had a successful test flight and docking with the station a couple months ago and which will be carrying crew to the station in December. <clears throat> I've also had the opportunity to be inside the, uh, the Spaceship 2 fuselage and inside the new Shepard capsule, right? Uh, all pretty cool. And that's because I pursued entrepreneurship and then followed that up with education, but always pursuing my dream uh, to be in space. I've been in all those capsules. I've not been in space yet, but I think I'm frankly pretty darn close to getting there. Um, and it's a totally alternate path from I'm going to become a you know, planetary scientist or, or I'm going to become a, a, a rocket propulsion engineer. Uh, so I want you guys to think that there's, there's always more than one road you can go. If I'd stuck with software, yeah, not so likely I would have gotten into space. So what can you do to make yourself connect in this way? You can do some research, right? And you can publish in academic research uh, journals or uh, in industry journals, like this paper I wrote here for uh, the AIAA, uh, which is an industry organization, of course. I wrote one on space policy, intergenerational ethics, and the environment. Um, this paper has really helped me later get government appointments, actually, because uh, it showed that I had a understanding of the purpose of space policy to benefit the Earth, right, both environmentally and, uh, and for the human beings that were involved. Uh, and I looked at the results of NASA's investment in public investment in space and, and how that has, uh, has supported benefits for the Earth and human beings. And that was back in 2012, before we were getting a lot of the discussion we're having now from some people on the, you know, what I would call the, the progressive left side who are worried that space billionaires are, you know, just having a party and wasting money and it's resources that could be better spent here on earth. Uh, the fact of the matter is almost everything we do in space is, is good for the earth. Uh, and I made these arguments back, back then. Uh, wrote articles for New Space Journal, which is a great place to publish. Uh, I did a, a big, uh, big piece on basically the state of the U.S., uh, a commercial industrial base back in 2014. Uh, I am on the uh, uh, 
a board of the Journal of Space Safety Engineering. I've written a paper there recently. Anyway, you can also serve your government. I started spending some time voluntarily on my own cost, but because I was an entrepreneur with money, I could afford it to fly to Washington, D.C. and just go walk through the halls of the United States Congress and the office buildings that the congressmen have their, uh, their offices in, bang on the doors and ask for meetings with either the member of Congress or their staffers. Usually I started with their staffers and worked my way up and I talked to them about how I felt commercial space was going to transform uh, the world. Uh, and, and make our country a better place. And I, I became recognized eventually as, as an expert on that. I've testified to Congress a couple of times. I was appointed uh, to the NASA agency review team in 2016. Does anybody know what an agency review team is? You guys know what a presidential transition team is? Have you heard that term? Well, in the interest of time, I'll just explain. So when a president is elected in the United States uh, in early November, they don't take over the White House until uh, January 20th. So there's a few months there, uh, preparatory work. And the new president's team, the president-elect, goes out and sends people into every agency in the federal government that the president has jurisdiction over, the executive branch of government. So there's a team in the Department of Commerce, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Education, and their job is to go in there and say, what is this department or uh, agency doing? Uh, what should we change, usually in keeping with whatever policy recommendations that the president made during the campaign? Uh, how do I keep my campaign promises, right? Uh, what programs should be canceled? What programs should be expanded? What programs should be left alone? Uh, what uh, personnel changes do we want to make, right? So um, I was appointed to that team because I had established myself through my writings and my visits to Congress as somebody who's credible. And uh, this team made a huge difference. I don't know if you guys had followed what happened during the last administration. Uh, last couple administrations, uh, have been pretty controversial and polarizing, but most people agree the space policy and the Trump administration, the Biden policy have been good and they've been consistent. So I helped set the, uh, the agenda uh, for our country to, for instance, reestablish the National Space Council to coordinate the efforts of all of our government agencies in space, uh, to establish a space force, to return to the moon, uh, to do more public-private partnerships, uh, including continuing the commercial crew program from, uh, from the previous administration, um, to uh, find a way to work more with our international partners, which resulted in the Artemis Accords. So it was a great opportunity. Um, and by doing that, I think I've got myself one step closer to being, being in space. Uh, I was appointed as the White House liaison or the, the representative for NASA to the White House in 2017 and nominated to be the CFO in, uh, in 2020. I also served on the, the ComStack, uh, the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Board at uh, FAA. Uh, every agency uh, has a, usually an advisory board that helps them get advice from the public or industry on how they should be doing rulemaking. So for instance, I chair the safety working group and I help to establish the rules around commercial space uh, safety and regulation uh, and to advise the FAA and what, what they should do there. You can do these things for your government. Uh, set, make sure that people understand that you're knowledgeable and, uh, and you're available. And as was mentioned earlier, be, be consistent. Uh, but they ask you to do something, make sure you deliver on it. And often that'll be, you know, help me prepare a report on something or give me some background information on this new technology that's coming up. So we as say an office of congressional staffers can know whether this is gonna be good for, uh, for our country, for the world, and most importantly, for our district and the people who reelect us. Uh, I have a textbook, write, publish when you can. It's a lot easier to do now than it used to be with digital publishing. You can self-publish, get out there and consider doing it. Um, I write regularly for foreign policy. If you're interested, you'll find a lot of articles I've written on, on space there. I have a science column at Forbes. Uh, I write regularly there and encourage you to follow me if you would. I hope you find it interesting. Right now, I'm doing a series of uh, reviews for my summer reading list, great space books written by friends of mine. I write regularly at Space News, uh, and I've made a difference there. 
I worked with Buzz Aldrin to help get uh, Jim Bridenstine nominated as a NASA administrator. And I'll tell you a little secret that nobody knows yet, but I'm organizing an event at Imperial College London to celebrate International Moon Day on Wednesday. And tomorrow morning, we're going to announce that Jim Bridenstine is, uh, is leading our panel on Artemis. Uh, we're going to also have Bahavi Alal, uh, the head of the Biden NASA agency review team, um, on, on that panel as well. And I'm excited about that. Have a coherent and constructive voice, all right? I'm going to encourage you to always be positive. There's a lot of people in this industry who always like want to naysay things. I hate whatever. I don't, I'm not happy with how much money is spent on James Webb te Space Telescope. I want to cancel it. I don't like the money being spent on SLS. I want to cancel it. I don't think the Lunar Gateway has a purpose. Uh, I'm taking a dig at my good friend Bob there. Uh, but I encourage you to, to focus on what it is you do love and not worry too much about what somebody else is doing because this is really important to understand and I came to understand it in detail when I spent six months being trained to be in the NASA CFO and kind of digging through the books and, and preparing for that, that confirmation process. If you cancel a NASA program, where does the money go? Who can tell me? Does it go to the NASA administrator who can now redeploy it for the thing that you love best in some other program? Crickets. Okay. No, it doesn't. It goes back to Congress. Only Congress can allocate any monies over $500,000 to NASA. The NASA administrator's budget limit for transferring funds is $500,000. You can't do anything in space with that. So if you canceled, say, the space launch system, uh, those billions of dollars would go back to Congress and be spent on Medicare or the F-35 or the literal... Uh, um, uh, Navy via vessel, uh, they would not be spent on the space program you love most. Um, so be really careful with uh, attacking other people's programs. It's generally not constructive. And in space, it simply results in NASA having a smaller budget and a lot of good people at NASA losing their jobs and a lot of capabilities that are multi-use and apply to many programs being, uh, being trimmed. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I like to point out that LinkedIn is always offering me great job opportunities. Okay, uh, what about you? I'm open to questions now. Beyond what we've already covered. And somebody mentioned the UN. Yeah, absolutely. There's a good place you can get involved in Copious. Uh, also the Hague uh, Space Resources Working Group is, is an interesting group looking on trying to figure out ways to equitably allocate the resources of the moon and other planetary bodies. What was the hardest part of my career? Wow. Um, you know, it was never of uh, the career part. It was almost always the distractions from the career, the things that happen in your life. Um, you know, at the risk of, of sharing more about my childhood, both my parents uh, were al uh, alcoholics and, and my dad was a, a cocaine addict. And uh, dealing with that while trying to also start businesses uh, was tough. And, and both my parents died fairly early dealing with their deaths as an only child, nobody else to help me while trying to run businesses was not easy. Um, other than that, I think it's self-confidence and not falling for imposter syndrome. Like how dare I, you know, go to college when none of my family had ever done that? How dare I get a master's degree? How dare I go out and be an adjunct professor and teach students? You know, first time I walked in that classroom, I'm like, Wow, I'm on the other side of the podium. That, that this is weird. I, I you know, I, I don't know that I belong here. How dare I go tell members of Congress what to do, or get a PhD, or receive an appointment uh, from the President of the United States and go before the Senate? Um, that self confidence thing um, was not easy. Uh, uh, and I encourage you guys to always, always have faith in yourself and realize the people you see up there doing amazing things, every one of them has self-doubts inside them. I guarantee you when the Neil and Buzz set themselves down on the moon, uh, you know, those two guys were scared and they had to think how in the world did, did I ever get here? Uh, uh, pretty amazing. So I think that, that I was the biggest obstruction in my career path at, at any given time. The resources are there for you. People want to help you. Um, in general, the world and this country are, is a pretty good place to be right now. Um, so, other questions? What about the various uh, 
versions of the space show that came out when the space show program started well, what's your opinion on those like that northrop grumman ssrt yeah there were a lot of great ideas in the 1970s uh any of you watch the show for all mankind if you don't i strongly encourage you you must watch for all mankind it is a uh, apple tv show uh freaking amazing it's an alternative history where the soviet union lands on the moon before the americans and this causes a couple of changes in the world one is that the space program gets more funding because the u.s has to still prove themselves right whereas we were able to cut back our funding after apollo because we'd already proved we were the greatest right uh and the soviet union manages to continue existing because they proved themselves to be uh uh more successful than they did in the in the real world so it's interesting history but they cover a lot of vehicles that never flew before like sea dragon a giant uh a uh, vehicle uh, that's launched from the ocean, uh, NERVA, the uh, nuclear propulsion systems. They have a nuclear space shuttle. They include uh, things that look like the uh, the, uh, the single stage to orbit uh, space planes that were, were being developed at that time. So yeah, um, there were a lot of good things we didn't do. And the space shuttle, frankly, was a big compromise of minimal technologies that produced something that wasn't as effective as it should have been. I love it personally for a lot of reasons. I used to sneak out into the desert to watch it land when I was was a high school student out uh, in Southern California. Um, but no, we could have done so much more. Uh, DCX and uh, and the SSST, like you mentioned, uh, huge huge losses. But we're looking at those things now. And often, what the government does is is paves the way by doing the initial research and development on something, and then abandoning it. And commercial folks come along and and make it happen. What was the most beneficial relationship you made in networking? Okay, I'll tell you a quick story before I have to go. Um, so I was at the Spaceship One launches in, in 2004, and there was a VIP party being hosted in a big tent with what they called the Billionaire's Boy Club. So you had uh, uh, Richard Branson and uh, a lot of other uh, high-tech billionaires uh, uh, in, in that room, uh, in that tent. And I wasn't invited because my ID badge that allowed me access to go see Spaceship One did not let me in that tent. You had to have a gold star on your badge to get in that tent. So I went uh, to the local uh, drugstore and uh, found a greeting card that had little gold stars on it. And I cut them out and glued one onto my badge and walked into the VIP tent and went and introduced myself to Richard Brantz and everybody else. And I remember Richard kind of looking like, who are you, right? Uh, and I, I told him, yeah, I, I went in and got a gold star at the drugstore and cut it out, glued on my badge. And he thought that was the funniest thing ever because he was a rule-breaking entrepreneur himself, right? And he actually liked the fact that I had broken the rules in order to get in to see him. Uh, so that really jump-started my career and allowed me to connect with everybody in the commercial space industry, which allowed me uh, to get the connections that eventually led to my government appointments as well. So. Uh, I would say that was the, the most beneficial networking move I ever made. Uh, sometimes you got to cheat just a little. Anyway, with that, it looks like our time's up. Um, uh, if you uh, would like, I'll share my uh, contact info uh, on social media and on LinkedIn, and, and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I am Greg W. Autry, and I'm emphasizing the W because there's another Greg Autry on on Twitter, for instance, uh, who is uh, is a uh, erotic photographer, and that's not me. <laughs> we would all like to thank you. We appreciate your wonderful, wonderful presentation and taking the time to help our students in their design challenge this year. No problem. There's my, uh, my email address. Uh, be glad to help, and I wish you all the best in your design challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Autry. Have a I, wonderful day. Get your bets to Mars. <laughs>